Hello fellow truth seekers, this is Barbara Jean and uh, hold on just a second. <laughs> I was distracted by my hoodie. Um, I got to keep my voice down because like I said the walls are paper thin and uh, I don't want to disturb anybody too early in the morning. It's 5.30ish, 5.30ish in the morning. So I have to keep my voice down a little, a little bit. Um, just some thoughts that were going through my head, like usual, lying around all day. Oh, well, every day. <laughs> I always have lots of thoughts. And and I was thinking, why why is that? Why is it that that's just what I do my whole life? I have just concentrated on the Lord and sought understanding. And it's my feminine mind. My feminine mind wanting answers. My feminine mind wanting to make order out of chaos. Um, I think that's really what the bottom line is. It's just there's a lot of unanswered questions that the um, established churchianity has not been able to answer. Um, they have tried. I'm not, not putting anybody down really uh, except for the fact that they have tried to answer questions such as with the Trinity, you know, this all male God that's both Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all male, and uh, a lot of other things that they, you know, that the church has taught over thousands of years, and and people have had questions about, but we've always just kind of brushed it aside and said, oh, this is the way it is, and you either accept it or you don't, and I guess it's just my mind saying there's got to be order to this chaos. You just can't put blank statements out there, such as there's an all-male God, and not have a really reasonable understanding, a, a, a reason for saying that. Um, but when you look at the evidence in the scriptures, it doesn't make sense. So my mind is trying to make order out of chaos, um, trying to put the puzzle pieces together. And this is the Lord, the Lord has given me to do. This is my calling. And I, I never really understood my calling for a long, 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 long time. I suffered greatly for many years with depression. And, and uh, I mean, I'm a woman of 60 years old. I just turned 60 this year. I was in the hospital, I turned 60. So I've gone through a lot of stuff in 60 years. Um, 50 of those years walking faithfully with the Lord, making a decision at 11 years old to be baptized into Christ Jesus. And it was a serious, I mean, at 11 years old, I mean, how serious can you be at 11? But I was pretty serious. It took me a year to think think about what I wanted to do. Whether I had the faith in this scripture, in, the, in, this, in this word that I had um, grown up with. I went, went to church all my life with my, my parents up to that point. So it wasn't like I didn't know the scriptures. I sat in church with my, my parents, and so I knew a lot about things. But so I had 11 years old. I was making a serious decision, and I made a I made a serious decision that I was going to follow the Lord at that point. Um. And so, but it's been a long, at least 50 plus years, almost 50 plus years of really delving into the deep uh, mysteries of the Lord and. My mind, through you know, like I said, different sources, and uh, not just the church I grew up in, but you know, different places that you you get the ideologies and the doctrines of the of the Christ of Christianity. That there, it leaves a lot of questions, and one of the questions, of course, a great part of the questions that I had, of course, had to do with the the the, the Trinity. Um, it didn't line up, and I remember being uh, in classes where this would come up, and never there was never really a real good explanation for it, as far as my mind was concerned. But we went along with it because that's what was taught, and we were expected to believe it because that's what was taught. And when I was about fourteen years old, the Lord gave me a thorn of suffering. Now. I'm going to get around to something here. I asked the Lord for a thorn of suffering in my heart. And the Lord pierced my heart with suffering. 
and I, I never understood understood it really and I still I still question I mean there's still times when I think why did I do it why not why did I do it I know why I did it I did it because I wanted to walk close with the Lord but I didn't understand why suffering had to be part of it why suffering why did the Lord put on my heart to be willing to take a thorn of suffering in my heart to make it a requirement to walk closely with him. And I think I've got some pretty good answers. And in fact, I was lying around like usual in my bed uh, thinking about it. And it all came up from this um, understanding weakness going back to the Church of Philadelphia. In fact, going back to all the churches again. You know what? The Lord has taught me so much, so much from the book of Revelation, from the seven churches. It, it boggles my mind how much wisdom I have through understanding the seven churches. It has been amazing. Look through all the ten years I've been on YouTube, people. Ten years I've been on YouTube. And almost from the start, the Lord brought me to this understanding about the seven churches. He led me to the book of Revelation. He wanted me to have a deep understanding of the seven churches. And the mysteries that have come up as a result of my just looking at this small passage compared to all the rest of it. And it's not like I left out the rest of the Bible because I haven't. But my understanding of of God and the church and the bride and, and his body and what Christ ate, what God wants from us from this this passage about the seven churches has been mind boggling. And the supernatural things the Lord has, has showed me and my little figurines which I have up here now, my seven figurines which I didn't intentionally buy, seven figurines which actually unintentionally match the seven churches. I mean, really. And then this chart, which I've had around for years and years and hardly even looked at. And suddenly the Lord reveals this chart to me about the body. The feminine body. His bride, his church, his body. He is our shepherd. He is our husband. He is our, he is our leader. He is our king. He is, he's, he, we are the ones in subjection to him. Not the other way around. He's not in subjection to us, people. We're in subjection to him. And here you have this chart in here. It's got a lot of other things out this chart, mostly about the feet, it's about foot and reflexology, and also the um, nerves of the feet, why they, why they relate to the body. Very interesting how it all corresponds. And uh, what I'm having the most problems with, to tell you the truth, right now, is this this part. I have hardly any feeling in my heels. The feeling is coming back in the rest of my foot, feet, but my heels and my feet are pretty numb at the moment. And um, as to do with the Church of Ephesus, Ephesus is the first church. Interesting, isn't it? There's no coincidences in this world. What was coming to me was in my little chart I'm talking about weaknesses and and how through suffering we are made perfect. In fact, God says when Paul was suffering so much, when we, most people believe it was with his eyesight and maybe other symptoms of illness, who knows what it was. But he was praying to the Lord for God to remove this thorn, that he called a thorn, of suffering that he was experiencing and he prayed three times and the Lord answered him and said no I'm not going to remove it isn't that interesting he wouldn't remove Paul's point of suffering he wouldn't remove the thorn that made him weak in the flesh and again it brings me back to the church of Philadelphia he also tells Peter that he's going to end up being weak why is that? Because through weakness he's made perfect. My grace is sufficient for you, for through your weakness, 
you will be made perfect. Okay? And I was looking at this chart, I'm going to bring up this chart. We start from a, a, point, a period of strength. We, we, every progressive um, um, pillar, which is what the church is doing, I'm talking about in my last video, the Holy Spirit has seven pillars, okay, in her house. And each pillar represents, um, it, it's interesting how this first church is described as being strong. Let me just go back there. To the book of Revelation, chapter 2, the very first church which has got the seven candlesticks, is described as being very strong. Um, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou can bear, not bear those which are evil. And thou hast tried them to say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and my name has, um, and has, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Um, they are very strong. They are strong and self-sufficient in themselves. They are self-righteous in a lot of ways. Okay. So they're dependent a great deal on their own strength of righteousness. And they haven't yet learned weakness. Christ didn't come to die for the strong. He didn't come to die for... Um, those who were healthy, he came to die, die for those who were sick. And we're all sick, even those who consider themselves strong. It is this understanding that we, when you know you need a savior, okay? When you know you need a physician, that you seek help. And in a lot of ways, this church has too much pride maybe to understand that they are in need of a savior. They're very self-sufficient. They're very self-righteous. They're very self, you know, through their own strength and power and will. I want to be good. And it's about doing rather than being. And I, when I was thinking how each church has goes from strength to ultimate weakness. This is the weakest of all the churches, this one here. Why? Because it has the most fullness of the Holy Spirit. We are the most honored. This church here is the most honored because of its weakness. Not because of its strength, but because of its weakness. Just like when I was talking to you about the passage about, uh, in first, I think it's First Peter, where it talks about husbands and wives. And husbands need to honor their wives as the weaker partner. Christ honors us because we have acknowledged our weakness. And it is, he honors us for acknowledging our weakness, okay? Um, and it's through our weakness that we are made perfect. Why? I was thinking, well, because it means that you are not relying on your own strength. You have given up your, your willpower, your own self-willpower, and you are finding your true strength in Christ Jesus. Um, it is in weakness that we're made strong. Why? Because when we're weak, He is strong in us. We are no longer relying on ourselves and our own self-righteousness and our own um, dutiful power <laughs> to make things change. And, and nor should we, and nor, nor can we. When you are in Christ Jesus, when you have been baptized into Jesus, which is what it talks about in um Romans, the book of Romans, which Paul wrote to the Roman church, he was telling them, in order to be strong, you have to become weak. When you are baptized into Christ Jesus, you're taking on his weakness. So, I thought, well, because I was thinking about this again today, I was thinking about it this morning. When Christ came to the earth, when he came to this earth, he gave up, what? His due to his power. Christ in the spirit had, was all powerful. He was God. He had endless ability to do whatever he wanted, create a world from what he wanted with the, with the word. He is the word. He is God. 
Therefore, he had this due to this power. But when he came to this earth, what did he do? He became weak. Purposely, he gave up his due to this power in order to walk as what? A human being. And not in his own strength. And I've told you this before many times too. That when Quax came to this earth and he did the miracles he did, he didn't do it in his power. He did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. He did it through his faith in the Father. He did what we as human beings should have been able to do and should be able to do through our faith and through our indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But because our faith is weak, not like Christ, Christ had perfect faith and, 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 and he was perfectly infilled with the Holy Spirit. So the, the things he did, he, he was showing us that through his weakness, he was strong. He was able to walk on water. He was able to multiply the bread. He was able to, I mean, Satan couldn't touch him. He was untouchable. He purposely became weak, and yet he was strong. I know it's an oxymoron. It doesn't even hardly make sense to our, our carnal minds to put, to really understand and grasp this. And, and I guess it brings me back to when I was a, a teenage girl and I received this thorn of suffering. What was I doing? I was taking on his weakness. I was I was making myself weak. In order for what? For him to be strong. And this is what brought me so much wisdom. And it didn't happen overnight. It came through a period of time. Through a period of, of trial and error. Ups and downs, highs and lows, I mean, the things I went through, the valleys and the mountains and all the things that I've had to trials and just tribulations. And I prayed many, many, many times in my life, Lord, take away this trial, take away this suffering, take away this trial, take away this suffering. And yet the Lord wouldn't do it. Why? Because that was not his intention for me. It was not my prayer. My initial prayer was to walk with Jesus in the high places. And the only way you can walk with Jesus is to participate in his suffering. And so many people, true people, Christian people, come to the Lord because they're in suffering. And there's, that's, that's great, they're coming to the Lord because they're suffering. But then they want God to take away all their suffering. And God won't do it. Why? Because you're made perfect through weakness. Peter could only rise to the church of Philadelphia. Why? Because he refused to take on the further suffering it would, it would take to become a God -bay. So what did the Lord do? He made him weak. So that he would become perfect. We were made perfect through weakness. So Peter was made weak. So was Paul. These very great men of God were made weak in order to perfect them. Think about that. Isn't that interesting? He had to make them weak in order to bring them to perfection. And he does the same for us. We have to become weak in order to be perfected. To that next level, when we participate in his suffering, when we participate in his death, burial, and resurrection, which is what it says in, in Romans, to water baptism, we become one with his death, which to the world is weak. Christ, when he went to the cross, and for people who still say this, when Christ went to the cross, he it appeared he was weak. To Satan, it appeared that he'd won. He thought he'd won because he, Christ, went to the cross. He suffered the cross. And to the world, it looked like Christ was defeated. Little did Satan know, and I'm sure he regrets right to this day, that it was through his weakness and his appearance of weakness that Christ became victorious over him. And the same thing for us. If you're not willing to take on Christ's suffering, such as his death, burial, and resurrection, which it says in Romans 6 and Romans 8, you can't participate in the resurrection of the dead. Not, not at the rapture. You can't. It's not possible. It's not possible. If you're unwilling to embrace this pillar of suffering, which includes the death, burial, and resurrection, which it says in Romans 6, let's just go to Romans 6. Well, if you just go to Romans 6 and read it for yourself. 
What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. I mean, the ultimate weakness. You are participating in Christ's moment of ultimate suffering and weakness. When you are baptized into Jesus, you are made perfect through weakness. It changes your heart. It gives you the heart of Christ. It gives you a heart of suffering for those who are lost. It gives you the heart of suffering for, for the injustices that are going on in the world. If you're not willing to participate in this, how can you expect to be raised up during the rapture? It's not possible. You could only become a temple of the Holy Spirit when you're participating in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus Christ went to the water baptism. He was the only person on the whole face of the earth who ever lived, who didn't need to be water baptized, and yet he suffered it. John the Baptist said to him, I should be, you should be baptizing me. And he was right. He was right. But Jesus said, let's suffer this to fulfill all righteousness. This baptism was, was ordained by God through, I mean, uh, through John, through God, by God the Father. They gave him this mission to initiate this, this ritual. It would be more than a ritual. It, it was a symbolic moment of Christ's weakness. And what he would suffer, his baptism, which is the baptism of death, burial, and resurrection. And when we participated, we are actually putting it on and we are now part of it. We are part of Christ's suffering. And if we receive that same suffering heart of Christ, through his weakness, we have become strong through Jesus. Because guess what, people? He raised rose from the dead. Through his weakness, his ultimate weakness, he became strong, and so do we. Now you know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. No small thing, people. And it's no wonder that so many Christians and good people refuse to be baptized, and they don't want to baptize anybody else either because they are afraid of this. They are afraid of taking on this ultimate weakness. They'd rather have their strength. Each church goes from strength to weakness. And there's a lot of people who are here in these, these areas here. Faith and, and uh, knowledge. Um, even giving up their own lives. Facing the fate and spirit of death. And all kinds of things that they have to do. But they haven't come to the ultimate weakness. Which is to to take participate in the weakness and the suffering of Christ. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that henceforth we should be should not serve uh, sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now think about that. That's an interesting statement. If you are not willing to get into the waters of baptism, you are not saying, you're saying, I don't want to be freed from sin. There's still sin is still serving me. I still have a purpose for it. I don't want to go in the ultimate weakness of crucifying myself and all my sinfulness to the Lord. There's still some things that I think are going to be useful to me. Think about it, people. Each church has some someone they're confronting. The, the church of Ephesus, they have to confront their own. They have to confront their own pride. Um, cowardice, um, the, 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 the seat of Satan. Uh, the Je Jezebel spirit, um, their own filthiness. And this church here has to confront their weakness. 
each church has something they have to confront in order to overcome. Okay? Now, quite, it's hard for us to understand that it is only through death that we are freed from sin. And like I said, there's a lot of churches, a lot of people, good people, Christian people who are saved. I'm certain they're saved. But have never been able to embrace the complete death of their sin. Not willing to be completely freed from that body of sin. So therefore they refuse to take that next step. That step that requires them the ultimate weakness. So here I was thinking. We are no longer slaves to sin. But it's made us weak. Okay. Uh, politically maybe. Financially. We're not the strongest church. Baptized believers are, are not because they're not controlled by men. It's the only church, the Church of Philadelphia, the weak ones that are not controlled by men. And I was used, I was thinking this myself, you know, when you look at, my church, I tried that again. When you look at the churches, each go from strength to weakness, go from strength to weakness. This church has the most fear in it. It's the most fearful, superstitious, and, and suspicious of women. Uh, they have re rejected the Holy Spirit on the, the strongest level. Um, and each church has a more growing awareness of, of, of weakness. Each church has a growing awareness of its own weakness as it is understanding the feminine, the, the feminine mystique. And, and that again brings me back to the enmity for the woman. This, they have the most enmity for the woman. They have the most enmity for the Holy Spirit. Because the, the feminine mystique, the feminine identity is in the mind of male energy is, is sought and thought of as being weak. Eve, she was weak. Well, so was Adam, but we don't want to acknowledge that. All we, all we want to look at is Eve and, and put the blame on Eve for her weakness but God has no Jesus had no enmity for the woman and in fact honors his bride for her weakness because when she is weak he is strong he, he takes on the role of the, the perfect male husband of the perfect husband he is strong on our behalf he protective he's protective of us as a, as a husband should be the provider all the things that a male energy should have he is perfect and we are made perfect when we are dependent on him 100 percent when we give it our own um, self-will and become weak each church has a growing sense of weakness but this they start out really strong here but they're the most fearful and i was thinking how it is that how does men and satan control the people masses through fear look what we're going through right now people the government oh we're gonna take care of you but you gotta be afraid you gotta be very afraid so do exactly what we tell you take take the, the take the v you know it's not gonna be good for you you'll be able to buy and sell man and through satan satan through man has controlled us through fear this is the only church that doesn't live in fear. Why is that? Because we're not controlled by man. We're controlled by the Holy Spirit. And Christ doesn't want his bride to be in fear. We're not supposed to be living in fear. Perfect love casts out fear. So what is it that Christ does? He, he wants us to love him. And by loving him, we are casting out our fear of man. Man controls man through fear. We're going to bring we're going to put you to death. We're going to cause war. We're going to do this. We're going to spread disease on, on, on all over the world. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. They, they make all kinds of plans to put people into fear in order to what? To control them. To control the world. They must put fear because they are controlled by their sin. Sin is from Satan. They are controlled by Satan to put fear in throughout the world. 
they are the ones who are causing things for famines and the chaos and the, and the droughts and the da 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 through all their mass um, their their um, their devices and all the things that they're doing. They're spreading the disease through the air. They're spreading the disease through the water. They're the ones doing it. Why? Because they want to control you. And yet this is the only church they can't control. Why? Because it's not controlled by man. It's controlled by the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. Okay? And they can't control you. They cannot. That's why they're not a reason they don't want you to be baptized. They want you in fear. They want to be able to control you. They can't control you if you're not in fear. Okay? This church, the Church of Philadelphia, interestingly enough, overcomes the synagogue of Satan. How is it that they do it? If they're so weak, and they are weak, they, they, <laughs> they bring the synagogue of Satan. Those who want to control you with fear, they bring them to their knees. How is it they do it? Is it through force, through swords wielding and guns shooting and, and, uh, is it through their, their mighty words of power and 